So, Lone Rider here, and I want to talk about um, pocket knives, and in particular, I want to talk about the the Kershaw knockout. Now, years and years and years and years ago, way back in the dark ages of the 1990s, I got this little bugger at a flea market, and it was my EDC for a while, and it's just kind of generic. It says Jaguar on there. Um, it's just kind of a generic uh, one-handed pocket knife. Uh, this was around the time when one-handed knives were really starting to become um, available widely. Um, and there were a lot of inexpensive options, and there were a lot of really expensive options. But there wasn't really a lot of stuff in the middle. And so if you didn't want to spend like 100 bucks or more, you were stuck with something like this. And uh, that's what I did. I got uh, one of these. And... Some others, some things from Frost Cutlery, and some other, you know, not so, not so great quality, but okay, knives. And um, I recently was going through my desk, and I, I came across this, and I said, you know, that blade profile, in particular the, the swedge on the top and the grind here, kind of remind me, in most extreme vague general terms, of the Zero Tolerance series. Um, and in fact, this does cut pretty well. Um, I have no idea about the quality of the steel. It's probably just your generic Chinese stainless steel, but uh, it does cut pretty well. But there's, uh, you know, there's not a lot to it. It's a, uh, it's ambidextrous thumb studs, but it's pretty generic, just made of different slabs of material. Um, you have a one-position pocket clip, you know, and um, some play in the blade. It's it's not it's not the greatest thing, but I said, you know. I wonder if I could get a decent knife about that size that resembles um, something like the Zero Tolerance 350, but um, but not, you know, doesn't cost like 150 bucks. And um, of course, my idea of decent is a little bit different than it was back then. I, I want something with a little bit better quality steel, a little more corrosion resistance, a little more ability to hold an edge, etc. cetera. Um, maybe a multi-position pocket clip, Maybe a little bit lighter. I mean, this handle is pretty chunky, etc. Um, so I started looking at some of the the CRKT offerings because I I have uh, a couple CRKTs. I mean, the the little short squat CRKT squid, which is you know a little like two and a half inch blade knife. Um, that was my EDC for a while, and um, I said, you know what? Let me uh, let me see if CRKT offers something, and it did. But then I came across some of the Kershaw knives. And in particular, I came across this one. And this is the Kershaw Model 1870. It's their um, their knockout is the name of the knife, uh, the Kershaw knockout, and the designation being uh, 1870. They have other offerings, uh, different handle colors, different blade finishes, and in some cases, I believe, different blade steels. But essentially what you get with this is you get a knife that has a multi-position pocket clip, so three position, here, here, or here. Uh, lightweight aluminum handle scales, very thin, you'll notice. A steel frame lock, they call this the subframe lock because the, the lock portion is made out of stainless steel, but the rest of the handle is um, uh, aluminum. Normally when you have a frame lock, it's made out of the same material as the, the handle. Um, but this allowed them to use a, um, a steel frame lock and still keep their aluminum handle. Uh, you'll notice the American flag symbol there. Uh, these are made in America. Um, and it's ambidextrous thumb studs, but also with a flipper. And the best part, look at that blade, right? Um, even more like the ZT than this crummy old flea market knife that I remember. So... Uh, I said to myself, I have got to get me one of these. And the cool thing is, um, actually, it is pretty similar to a, a zero tolerance. I didn't, I wasn't aware of this until um, shortly before I got the thing in hand. But um, zero tolerance apparently has a company connection to Cursor. And if you, this is spring assisted, so when you get to about there, there's no tension, but initially there's a little bit of tension and it just helps you pop it out. 
I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but if you read about, they call their 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 opening assist the um, speed safe system. That's their their corporate name for it. And if you read the description of the zero tolerance knives, uh, zero tolerance calls their spring opening system speed safe as well. So um, you know, and if you do if you do the research, they they are affiliated. So um, basically, you're getting you're getting a um, it's not a knockoff. It's it's legit. It's made in the U.S. Uh, it's just it's not a zero tolerance, but it's as close as you can get for you know like a hundred dollars less. Which you know if you're on a budget, this is great. Now that says it's not cheap. They run you about sixty or seventy bucks, but it's better than a hundred and sixty or a hundred and seventy. Um, and in fact, at that price, you could probably get two of these. <laughs> um, but but here's the thing. Um, The, the quality is pretty darn good. Um, you know, the, the thing that surprised me most about this knife is the weight. I was in the store and I picked up uh, several knives that were smaller than this. And the funny part is they actually weighed more. All right. They were they were shorter. They weren't as tall. They might have been a little thicker, but they were shorter. They weren't as tall. They weren't as long. And they uh, they weighed more. Why? Well, the aluminum handle scales and the fact that they're very thin handle scales. And yes, there is a bit of a backspacer, but you still have a little bit of open space there. So it's a semi-open design. Now, this feels great in the hand. Um, and, you know, you don't have a lot of texturing on it. A lot of knives, they have uh, stippling or, or grooves on the back here or under here. This doesn't have that. There's a little bit of texture on the sides of the grip, sides of the grip slab, but not much. However, the shape of it makes it really sort of stick in your hand. You've got this big um you know half circle there it's curved here it's cut off at an angle there which fits against your hand this curve fits against the palm of your hand and then your thumb can go back up there so it's really it really is designed to fit the hand very similar in a way to you know when you open a spider co knife uh and you hold it in your hand the curve really just fits between the this part of your palm and and, and the inside of your fingers and this, this fits in, in much the same way. Um, and the, the flipper that's on the back of the knife ends up on the front when you open it and provides a little bit of a hand guard there. Not in the sense of a hand guard like you'd have on a sword, where the idea is to protect your hand from strikes, but simply to keep your fingers from slipping up, which is a good idea because these come pretty darn sharp. Um, now, you'll notice you have the option to open it with the flipper uh, or with the thumb studs. And I like that. There's some people like the versions without the thumb studs because they look cleaner and you don't really need them. Uh, I like the options. Although, to be fair, um, when I have used this, I've used it mostly with the flipper. Um, now, the spring thing, I, I'm not a big fan of assisted opening knives. Uh, first of all, let's be clear. Legally, an assisted opening knife is not a automatic knife. So it has a little bit of a spring tension, enough to assist you in the first part of the opening of the knife but you're not pressing a button or a switch you're, you're you're physically you're physically pushing the blade out of the knife using either the thumb stud or the, the flipper um, and the spring tension isn't enough to open the knife all the way you'll notice if i if i hold it so the spring tension doesn't make it open and then i let go it stops in automatic knife if i let go it would spring open all the way um, and of course an automatic knife is triggered by pressing a button rather than operating, you know, physically uh, manipulating the blade. That said, um, I mean, personally, I don't get the restrictions on automatic knives. Um, and if you live in a place where, you know, there's no restrictions on them or there's fewer restrictions than there are in places like, uh, you know, New Jersey, uh, good for you, you know, go get one. Um, a lot of people say, well, what's the point? Well, I, I'll tell you what the point is. Um, Sometimes, you know, not everybody has the same level of dexterity. Not everybody has the same, um, you know, uh, uh, tasks they need to do. And sometimes it might benefit one person where another person, they just see it as something frivolous to have because it's cool. Um, and that kind of is my, my changed opinion on uh, assisted opening in knives. 
I used to think it was gimmicky, and I also used to think, frankly, that it was just something else to go wrong, um, something else to have to maintain or take care of or oil or whatever. Um, I still believe that the simplest construction is best, so obviously any kind of a spring mechanism in there, it doesn't help from a simplicity of mechanical design standpoint in terms of building something with the fewest moving parts that's going to last the longest and need the least amount of maintenance. However, one of the things I did learn from having a bit of injury on this side, I'm left-handed. I've been left-handed my whole life, but I've always used a knife with my right hand. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is the fact that um, I think when I was growing up, I kept my keys in my left pocket being left-handed, and therefore the pocket knife, which at the time was probably like one of those little uh, Swiss Army knives, went in this side because the keys were in the other. So I spent over 20 years learning to use a knife with my right hand. And um, I found that in many cases, in terms of uh, the dexterity of having to open a, a thumb stud, um, you know, it's it's very easy to flub it with my uh, with my right hand now. I don't have the there's a little bit of a, like I said injury. So um, you know, for everything else, I'm glad the injury's to this side because I am left-handed. But for using a knife, it became a little difficult. Um, so I didn't have I wasn't comfortable doing it with this hand. Uh, really with a traditional knife on a daily basis, especially in situations where I might need it to get it out quickly. Uh, whereas with this hand, I didn't have the the practice with it. So it was kind of a lose-lose situation. This hand, I didn't feel comfortable doing it because of the injury. I was afraid I might get cut or something. This hand, I didn't have the practice to do it as smoothly as I did with the other hand. Uh, what was I going to do? Well, the cool thing about this is it has the, the flipper and it has the thumb studs, and it has the speed safe, as they call it, uh, spring assist. And while the spring assist would have been a perfect gimmick, as far as I'm concerned, and absolutely useless, had I had two good hands, um, the uh, having a bit of injury on my right hand side uh, makes it very clear to me that there is an advantage to something like this. The advantage is it allows somebody like myself, who is still trying to get the knack of dealing with this thing, to, to open a knife the way I used to, with my right hand. Um, and similarly, if I should I choose to do it left-handed, the fact that you know I, I, I'm, I'm not as used to doing it with my left hand, um, I'm less likely to flood it because there is that um, spring assist there to, to, to help, help get past the initial part of the opening. So, um, you know, my... my Thoughts on the spring assist in knives has changed greatly. And again, it's not like a switchblade, so you know people shouldn't freak about that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with switchblades either. It's just that in some cases, people live under draconian laws. Uh, but yeah, for, for uh, somebody who has maybe a difficulty in, in getting the knife open, having the two options, especially the flipper, I find is a lot easier to use frankly. And I, like I said, I grew up with knives like this for years uh, that just, just had thumb studs. Um, and I could still do the thumb studs, although, like I said, it's awkward with my right hand and it's awkward. I mean, it's awkward with my right hand and it's awkward with my left hand for two different reasons, but nevertheless. However, with the, with the flipper, it's just so easy. And it, you know, uh, so I'm loving this thing. And if you're, if you're in the market for a, a normal size, um, EDC knife. Uh, I would say this is this is a pretty good one. One of the things you'll note about it is, although the blade is pretty thick and you know and, and uh, wide this way, it's not long. Um, it's it's not any longer than you know a lot of other pocket knives. I mean, my my Ontario Rat 2 is about the same length. Um, and in fact, you'll notice because of the way it comes down, you know the handle may actually end here. But the cutting edge ends here, uh, and because of this, because it is so thick for much of its length in terms of, or I should say, so tall uh, for much of its length, thick would be this way, uh, in in this plane, you you do get a lar long curve on the front. So if you look at this, you actually have a lot more cutting edge than you do length of blade, um, and it's just it's just a very useful thing. They they really I think have tried to get the most out of it. Um, you know, I would say this this is a fair 
um, you know, if somebody wants a, a zero tolerance and they don't want to drop the kind of money because, I mean, they are an arm and a leg, let's face it. And especially if it's a knife you're going to be using on a daily basis or maybe weekly basis, you don't want to, you don't want to get it beat up. Um, this, it's a little easier to see scuff marks on the blade and to have to resharpen it and do all kinds of stuff because you're like, well, okay, it's a really nice, well-made knife, but it didn't cost like a week's pay, you know? And, um, yeah, these, these, these things are pretty cool. So they, they make this model, which like I said, is the, is the, uh, 1870, uh, Kershaw knockout and they make uh, several others. One is a black blade and a olive drab handle. One has an olive drab handle with what they call a Damascus blade. Of course, it's not true Damascus. It's actually pattern welded, but you know, they call it Damascus cause that's the look. Um, the, uh, there's some others I think as well, perhaps with different steels. Uh, the steel on this is a Sandvik steel, which um, I, I don't know much about it, uh, except that apparently it's a better grade steel than on their um, Chinese made knives, which are, you know, well designed, but obviously are going to be, you know, uh, made to a slightly different standard of fit and finish and maybe material spec as well. I mean, this one's made here in the U.S. and it costs about twice what their some of their, you know, very, very budget knives cost. That said, this in itself, I would argue, is a budget contender as a stand-in for the Zero Tolerance. So maybe even, depending on who you talk to, as a better knife than the Zero Tolerance. Um, maybe just in different ways. Uh, the ZTs are built like tanks. I've handled them in the store. They're pretty awesome. Um, my, my first introduction, frankly, was um, on that Old Navy cop show, NCIS, uh, the old guy who was the boss, um, um, Mark Hammond's character, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, Mark Harmon's character, uh, Gibbs, yeah, had, had a zero tolerance knife. And it, in fact, it, he had the one with the tiger stripe blade, I think the, the ZT350 something or other. Um, and when I was in the store, they had one and I was looking at it and I was like, oh man, that's so freaking awesome. But yeah, it's 160 bucks, whereas this is like 60 bucks. So, I should say it was like 70 with tax. So, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're, you don't want to drop an arm or a leg or a firstborn, especially for a knife you're going to actually use rather than just keep, you know, as a collector's thing. Um, this is definitely a more affordable option. Like I said, it's a hundred dollars less. You can't beat that. Um, but then there's this thing to consider. The zero tolerance is a great knife and it's built like a tank. This is light. Like I said, with, because of the aluminum handle, it, it's lighter than a lot of knives twice its size. But you still have that steel lock, and you have a very sturdy construction. And as far as the spring assist is concerned, if you care about those things, it has the same type of spring assist as in the zero tolerance knives. The, 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 the SpeedSafe brand spring assist. So, um, you know... The ZT is probably a hundred more for a reason. I mean, some of it might be, well, you're just paying for the brand name, but um, this is definitely a great affordable option by comparison. And, um, you know, like I said, although it is affordable, it also is made in the U S and um, like I said, it, it only costs a um, hundred dollars less. Right. I mean, wow. <laughs> uh, now here's, here's another thing to consider. On its own, this stands up. Yes, compared to the Zero Tolerance knives, this is a great budget alternative for a very similar knife. But here's the thing. If you've never seen the Zero Tolerance knives, if you've never handled one, if you've never, you know, uh, heard somebody, you know, uh, talking about them or, or seen pictures, if you just saw this on its own and picked it up and said, oh, what's that? Wow. Yeah, it's it stands on its own as a great knife. So, you know, I would say um, consider that too. By itself, in and of itself, without comparing it, contrasting it to anything, uh, it's its own good knife. So, you know, yes, it's a it's a great option if you want something. Uh,